We have this data because marine fisheries are a really uh, large source of income and are, um, they, they give a lot of money to various countries. So we're very interested in sort of how they're changing through time. So this, we have a lot of data on this. We, and we have a lot of data for large megafauna, things like birds, mammals. And we actually have a lot of data on plant size, mostly because of agriculture and how plants are changing through time in size and specific traits. But other than that, there's not a lot of data out there. So people interested in sort of smaller animals, invertebrates, which I care about, <laughs> we don't really have that much trait data available for them, unfortunately. So uh, reproduction, um, we've already again discussed this, but examples include age at maturity, number of offspring, lifetime reproductive output, so how many um, offspring is an individual having over their entire lifespan on average. Physiology, so examples of this, uh, thermal tolerance, disease resistance, um, stoichiometry, so example chlorophyll content, um, and again, sort of the temporal sensitivity is anywhere from a year to 10 years. And the data on this is extremely limited. So for body size, so morph morphology and phenology, there's actually global data sets available. Uh, they're, they're still limited in many regards, but there are global data sets available. But for things like um, physiology, they're very limited data. And the, um, and there's really no global data sets available, which is a problem. <coughs> and then movement. Um, again, things like natal dispersal distance, so how far does uh, an organism disperse after it's born, migration routes, um, and then something you might not think about is cell sinking of phytoplankton. So what's the rate at which cells of phytoplankton sink, um, and how, how far do they sink? <coughs> and the data for this are also not so great, um, but they're getting better. So we're doing um, a lot of actually uh, tracking of movement of organisms, mostly large scale uh, uh, global sort of migra migratory patterns. Um, and that data is available, which I'll show you in a second. So we've talked about these different um, types of traits that we might be interested in. So how do we get this data? The that's the next question. Or where is this data coming from? Um, and there's a variety of different sources for this data. So one is coming from the published literature. So we can actually go to the published literature and pull out specific information from it that people have um, published. So things like the size of organisms, the shape of organisms, the timing of, of, of various activities, so the flowering of plants, that might be published already in various papers. So these sorts of databases, so Compadre, which Town already talked about, and Comadre, they're actually pulling out that data from the published literature and putting it in these online databases. We can also get this data, though, from specimen collection. So I already talked about this, right? If we go to a herbarium, let's say in Malawi, and we're looking at plant records in that herbarium, we can actually measure uh, traits from those plants, right? So we can measure perhaps when they were flowering. We can measure the size of those flowers, the size of the leaves, the size of the stem. And somebody could go to specimen collections um, or, and, and do that. It, would, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of effort, but there are initiatives that are actually doing this on broad scales and putting it online. And certainly you guys can do the same thing if you, get, if you write some grants and get some funding to do it. Um, and then of course there's uh, actual monitoring, right? So you can design a study and you can actually monitor how things are changing, so phenology, morphology, within your study organism, within a plot of land, through time, so perhaps a protected area. And when you're thinking about this in situ monitoring, usually this isn't um, global, right? So this is, a, this is local, this is in a particular area. And if you want to make it global, if you want to compare it um, to other 
uh, similar sort of um, environments, similar organisms, but in different areas. You want to make sure that you're designing your study in a systematic fashion that can be sort of repeated and can be standardized when you are comparing it to those other data sources. And we can talk about that um, if, you, if you're interested. And then remote sensing. So uh, Ben is going to talk to us more about remote sensing this afternoon, but we can perhaps get some species trait data from remote sensing. Um, what could be problematic with this, though, if we're, th if we're focusing on species traits? Do you have any ideas? It's not impossible, but it's just more difficult to use remote sensing to get at species traits. Why might that be? I think uh, some species can be very small to be visualized using uh, some remote sensors. Sure. Lenses. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. So he said that essentially a lot of species might be too small to actually get at with remote sensing technologies, and that's certainly true. What are what are some other issues though? Uh, some traits require attention to be observed, so they can't be detected by remote sensing. Yeah, so some traits that you might be interested in can't be detected by remote sensing. Sure, absolutely, that's true. But think more, uh, yeah, which? Some of the species um, detect them require high resolution images which are very expensive. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. So you're kind of getting at the crux of, of what I was uh, referring to. So basically, Species traits are referring to um, particular species, right? We're interested in a particular species um, and how it's changing. And remote sensing uh, usually gets at sort of a, a group of species or, or a broad scale look at how something is changing. So for example, vegetation through time, right? And so we can use remote sensing to get at um, how vegetation is changing through time or when things are flowering, but it's really difficult to get at what is the species that is flowering or what, is the, what are the specific species that we're looking at when we're doing remote sensing. And Ida talked a bit about this earlier, actually. So when you're doing the really cool um, imaging of your forest, you get this really, really uh, precise measurement of the volume of these trees. <coughs> But what was the problem that Ida talked about? You don't know the species, right? You don't know the species. You have to have a botanist go in there and identify those particular species. And so this is possible, right? You can use a combination of methodologies to get at particular species, but it's actually quite difficult right now with our current technologies and it's very expensive. Um, and so when you have to remember when we're thinking about species traits, we're actually interested in the specific species, not the community. So we can use remote sensing to get at community level data, which is an EBV and Town talked about. Um, and and uh, Ben will talk about some other e uh, EBV classes that you can use remote sensing for. But for species traits, it's, it's a bit more difficult. Okay, so um, these are some online resources, uh, global online resources, for where you can access some of these species trait data. So Tom already talked about um, this compadre data set, database, and it basically um, has a bunch of uh, plant trait data. So compadre is um, plant species, and we ha there's survival uh, rates, there's growth, development, aging, so how long do these plants live, um, reproduction rate, etc. age at maturity of plants. So you can go here um, to get plant trait data that's global. This TRI database, it's also global and it also provides trait data, species trait data um, for plants. And so actually we can go there. Okay, so this is TRI, the plant trait database, and I just went to data portal, um, and then you can look at information by trait. So you can go to the trait table here, 
and you can just get a sense of all of the different traits, hypothetically, that are available. So um, to read off some of them, this is bark crystals, bark density, um, low grand plant organ polyphenol content, um, below ground plant organ ratio of lignin to nitrogen. So you can get a sense that there are a lot of different traits available um, in this database. And so this is something that you could go to if you're interested in a particular plant species and see if that data, if any trait data are available. Um, yeah. Can get to the by traits? So, yep, I'll do it again. The thing to keep in mind with this database is you have to sign up. So it is available, it is freely available, but you have to sign up and get an account to download the data. So I'll do it again. So this is, tr this is the database when you first get to it. I then clicked on data portal here. And then I said explore the tri database. So data explorer. And then I went to trait table here, go to trait table. And then if you scroll down, you'll see all of these traits. But can you get it without signing up? You can get the trait table, but you can't actually uh, get to the, the actual data. So I think to get the, to download the actual trait data here for a particular species, you'll have to sign up, I'm, I think. Um, okay, so let's go back to PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, so I talked about Tri and Compadre. Those are both plant trait databases. Um, and then these are some uh, animal trait databases. So Comadre, which again, Town talked about yesterday. Um, and then VertNet has a bunch of trait data for vertebrates. Um, including things like body mass and body length. So I just wanted to show you that briefly. <laughs> uh. Okay, so I'll just go back. So this is vertnet. This is vertnet.org. So that's where I went. Um, that's the, the first page you go to. And then, if I can see, I can go to search. And I can search for a particular species. And so the species that I'm searching for right now is the Nile perch. So I'm going to just paste in the species name for the Nile perch. And I'm going to say search now. And after some time, it's going to give me records for the Nile perch. And then what I can do is I can go to advanced search options, because this is going to give me a list of Nile perch in VertNet. And that can have any, any kind of data quality. So it can just be sort of, I found this Nile perch in this particular location. But there can also be a lot more information. So if I want to filter those records to only show me Nile perch that have length information, for example, I can actually do that. So um, it's a bit difficult. So advanced search options here. And then what I want to say is has length. For example, let's say I'm interested in the length of these fish, right? So I can go here and search for only those records that have length information. And then I can research. And now it's going to pull up a list of those records that of Nile perch with length information um, and usually those records have latitude and longitude, so locality information as well. And I'm going to see how long those uh, particular fish are from particular locations. So it's, a, it's, it's actually quite a powerful resource uh, that you can use for this sort of trait, species trait information. 
So here we go. Why it's pulling up birds, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, so, so what I did, I didn't actually put in the species, I had to re-put in the species name, um, my Nile perch species name. So this is actually pulling up everything that has uh, length information for all records, which is fine as well. But if you wanted to click on a particular um, record, so this is a reptile. So this is the record, right? So you can see uh, where it is held, so uh, the California Academy of Sciences, it's a preserved <coughs> specimen, it's a physical object, we know who it was recorded by, we know the type of, of how it's preserved, so it's cleared and stained, um, and then we know sort of how, how long it is, uh, hypothetically, we know where it's collected, latitude and longitude, um, etc. And then we know its length, length in millimeters, 57.37. And we know the length type, snout vent length. Sorry, just a comment. Yeah. You saw that snout vent length was above under remarks. Yeah. And that's kind of informal and unstructured. The important part is down here, where Darwin Core has yeah. specific accommodation for presenting those data. Yeah. Yeah, so in the comments, so what Tom was referring to above, which I, that's why I sort of breezed over it, um, is that here, occurrence remarks, it says snout vent length, SVL, that's what that stands for, 57.37 millimeters. And that obviously was on the initial sort of tag, right, or, or the metadata associated with that specimen. But you actually want to look for the specific entry, the Darwin <coughs> core record, which Town mentioned yesterday, um, with that information which is here, length in millimeters, 57.37. So again, this is giving you um, a place where you can go and start to get these sorts of data. Um, so to go back... Sorry. Uh, yeah. No worries. Regarding the... the because you're talking about the fish... Length. Yeah, so the reason... The reason... Oh, so no, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The, about the attitude. Uh, because it's you get it down and then you how do you measure the altitude? Sorry? Altitude. I've seen the altitude zero point something. The altitude. Just Oops. Yeah, there you go. This more altitude. On top. Yeah, I think that more. Yeah. This is latitude. Oh, latitude and longitude. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the location of where it was collected. Oh, sorry. So sometimes you can have the altitude at which a specimen is collected. Uh, I don't think here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, so this actually isn't a fish. So the, uh, what I did is that I researched for any record that had a length. But what I, could, uh, I, what I should have done is re-put in my species name, my fish, my Nile perch, and then search for any record that had length information. So the reason this is a reptile and not a fish is because I didn't re-put in that species name in my search. Okay. So, um, so we talked about some of the databases that you can get trait, species trait information, but this paper, which is open access, so everybody can get to it. If you go to the supplementary materials, there is a table, so it's uh, table S3 or 4, that has a list of all of the databases that they know about where you can get species trait information. Um, and it says whether they're open access, it says whether they're global or whether they're focused on a particular region, and it says what type of information is, is uh, available, so whether it's for plants or animals, etc. And then we talked about these additional resources already. So we talked about that you can go to museums and herbariums, and you can get um, specimen information from the actual, uh, species information from the actual specimens. Um, and we talked about how you can design your own in-situ monitoring 
and how you can perhaps use remote sensing um, to get at these species trait information. The thing to keep in mind, remember, when you are getting these data, which Town talked about yesterday, is you need to be careful about standardizing the information, and you need to be careful about comparing like to like. So when you're downloading length data, for example, from VertNet, that's fine, right? It's probably all going to be in millimeters, and if it's not, you can do some conversions, and you can look at fish in millimeters. That's pretty easy. But if you're looking at sort of other trait information, you'll want to make sure that you understand how they collected that particular data so that when you're compiling different data sources, you're comparing like to like. And then the last thing that I want to mention before we jump into the activities is that this species trait information, in addition to being useful for monitoring sort of how species are responding to human pressures or environmental changes, it can also be useful in climate modeling. Um, and this is sort of beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, but we can actually input these specific species trait data into climate models and vegetation models to get a better sense of how vegetation and climate is going to change in, in the future. And what we're realizing as a scientific community is that inputting these, spe these species trait information into these sorts of modeling frameworks is really, really important for getting better and more accurate predictions of how climate and vegetation will change through time. And so if you're interested in this, I put a number of journal articles about this um, here, which you, can, which you can look up and I can provide the papers for you as well.